stronger together. We are the Harmony Conference. Um, the Harmony Conference consists of uh, a, a few Methodist pastors, a family, of course, um, some lay uh, folks, and some also artists and uh, writers. Um, we are um, artists in our, in, our, in, our, in our own right all together. Um, but we all come together with the common uh, commonality of social justice finding ways to uh, conversate and, and create dialogue that would hopefully lead to comprehensive solutions uh, in our communities. As pastors, we are leaders, so we, we refuse to sit idly by and watch the unjust uh, deal with their plight alone. Um, if you could just be my guest and make sure your phones are on mute, um, and as we move forward, each uh, person that is uh, scheduled to speak will have their moment. But again, I just want to welcome you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, my name is Pastor Jeremiah Jermaine Paul. I'm the pastor of East Berlin United Methodist Church and also South Meriden Trinity uh, in Connecticut. Um, I'd like for everyone to just have a moment to introduce themselves. Yeah, Bob Knabel. I'm uh, the West Hartford United Methodist Church, West Hartford, Connecticut. Hi, I'm Melissa Hinnon, and I'm the pastor at Park Slope United Methodist Church in Brooklyn. You can call me just simply Han. I'm the pastor of New Milford, Edinburgh, and also Grace United Methodist Church. Uh, Reverend V.P. Taylor, I am his associate elder at Emmanuel Pentecostal Church in Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, my name is Susan Chapungo. I'm an elder in the New York Annual Conference, and I am pastoring an emerging community of faith called The Table in Pleasantville, New York. Hello, everybody. Nikki Edelman. Um, I pastor two churches, uh, Stevens Memorial United Methodist Church in um, South Salem, New York, and the Zions Hill United Methodist Church in Wilton, Connecticut, so one foot in each state. I'm, I'm Tim Riss. I'm the uh, district superintendent in the New York, Connecticut district. Hi, I'm Doug Cunningham. I'm a pastor at Asbury United Methodist Church in Croton on Hudson. I'm Karina Feliz. I serve the West Point Parish uh, Four Point Church. I'm PJ Leopold at Darien United Methodist. God bless you, PJ. Thank you for being here. All right, well, we're going to get things moving of the Harmony Conference. We'll have a moment to, to speak and introduce their topics. But before we do that, let us bow our heads and pray. Most loving, most gracious, most kind, most merciful God, thank you for these minds. Thank you for these hearts that have made it, that have made up to be here with us. They, they have made it up in their minds to be here. Thank you for their their willingness to, to listen. Thank you for their ears to hear. Lord God, thank you for this historical mm -hmm. moment in time. As we move forward as the Harmony Conference, we ask that you be with our conversation, be with our solutions, be with our ideas, be with us as we press forward and trailblaze uh, this path. In your name, we always pray and we always move. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's come together for our scripture reading from the gospel, Matthew 25, 35 through 36. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothing and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. This is Tom. This is a reading from Luke, chapter 19, verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I return back four times as much. Today's discussion is called the church, the community, the culture climate. And um, just to also inform you, 
we were supposed to have an in-person banquet dinner with art and music and a panel discussion. We had our, we had our, um, we had our venue that was donated. Like we had, we, <laughs> we were all ready to go and we've been planning since January and then COVID hit and it kind of put a dent in our plan. But I believe that God and the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit had a, had a different plan for us because um, here we are. So the question I have for my clergy colleagues, my friends who are here, and I, and I, I want to just say thank you for being here. And if you hear something that touches you the wrong way, just know we're speaking out of love and we're speaking from our authentic selves and we can hear and understand each other. We don't always have to agree, but we still love each other. That's who we are as Harmony Conference. We want to hear each other. So my question is, how has your congregation responded to the cultural revolution that's happening during COVID-19 in, in real time today. And anyone can jump in. We're going to spend maybe two or three minutes on each question. But we want to hear from you all. I was just thinking about uh, one of the ways that was kind of interesting when the uprisings first happened in the streets and being in Brooklyn. And, you know, we were, most of us were just still home. Like we were like, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> and, um, and it took me kind of a few days before I would go out into the streets even as part of the protests. But especially for the elderly people in the congregation or people that were at higher risk, which is many of our churches, that's the majority of the people. But what we found is that we were able to support the young people. So we found ways to say, okay, well, so-and-so's daughter or granddaughter who just graduated from college and hasn't been able to find a job, imagine that, you know, they want to be out there and they want to provide hospitality and they want to be able to give out masks and, and be part of this in a way that we can support them as the church in, in that particular context. And so that was one way that we were able to really, and UMCOR provided funding for that also, which um, you know goes to kind of the bigger denominational resources that I think that we can call in for these kinds of things. And then now as things are opening up a little bit more, um, I think that the, the church, people in the church want to have those conversations with the police. They want to know, like they're asking those questions. Well, who do, who do we talk to? How do we build a relationship with the police department? Um, you know, I remember, I think it was like around Christmas time um, that there was like, we were like all of a sudden there was a police officer just sitting in the car in front of our church building. And I was like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? Um, oh, we're just helping, you know, we're just keeping an eye out because it's the holiday season and this is what we do. And it was kind of a strange thing. It felt odd to me that, um, you would just sit there and who are you watching for and what are you expecting? And, um, but, but if we have those relationships ahead of time or that we're building those relationships and we can have conversations around accountability. Um, and I think particularly, you know, like we're, our precinct, I remember like, I think it was the first or second day of the protest, like in Park Slope where the police car ran through the crowd, you know? And if we had had already an existing relationship with the police department as a church community, we perhaps could have addressed it directly um, instead of kind of going the route of just kind of outrage, which was appropriate, but we would have had a more intentional way to, to address it, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Every and every and every community is very different. Like there's not, you know, a cookie cutter response or way to to journey through this. But we we ask this question because it's important. As we know, as as Christians, it is when we come together and as the as a as a church, as a people, uh, as a corporate body, you know, the leader and congregation. Um, in a community, we are that lighthouse. We are that, um, we are where the people find God. And so our outreach as the church is so important in responding to the different things, whether it be like through art, like uh, one of the things I did is I wrote a play and I'd like to share it with all of you at one point. But, um, you know, and, and every congregation being very different and as pastors you know your own congregations you know what things your congregation is ready to you know how to engage them in bringing or being the solution and being the lighthouse when it comes to the different 
um, uh, different issues that systemically and that hinder our, our, our communities. So just as you all are thinking about this question, I'm going to put out the next question and you can go back to the question if you like, that's fine. Um, it is, how do you see your church or your community you serve spiritually growing? How do you see and where do you, the vision of, of leading in such perilous times or times like this where, you know, I call it perilous, but not really. I mean, the, this week's lectionary is going to be really great we don't know, <laughs> uh, because it really is what we say it is as we are the, the you know, as we lead forward as the cornerstone, as the, as the light in a world that is in need of a savior. And here we are, you know, the people of God stand up. One of the things that I've been noticing as a person who is looking to plant a new church in a community is how distrustful people in the community are of the church. Um, we have not lived into what we're supposed to do and model for the world. Um, if we are supposed to be the lighthouse that shows people what it looks like to live in harmon harmonious community together, even as an institution and a denomination or even a local congregation, so often we have failed to do that well. And so one of the things that um, we are really working on here in my area in Pleasantville is um, learning to be community all over again. Um, I think that we have really failed to do that as a church and I think we're failing to do it as a nation. And so we're showing up and being willing to model what it looks like as leaders to be vulnerable and to admit that as we try to be a community of faith that's welcoming to everyone, and when we say all are welcome, we really mean all means all, but that we, whenever we have relationship with each other, um, we will hurt one another. And so how then do we own um, the harm that we do and how do we have the humility to receive the feedback about the ways um, that we've been harmful in our relationships and in the community and then work through that together? And I think it's one of the things um, that we're lacking on, a, on, a, on all levels from the bottom to the top. And so we are really putting efforts out to gather diverse groups of people and to live out this idea of relationship and um, deep listening to each other's stories and even learning how, how to disagree with respect. Um, that's one of the biggest things that we're working on right here um, to show that we can do that work and that in doing that, we hope um, we can witness to our faith and to the transformational power of the love of Jesus and God's grace. But we have lost the ability to even proclaim that good news uh, because we haven't lived it out well ourselves. And so that's where we're starting, is, is looking to model that um, so that our message has integrity again. I want to jump in just to say something. Not right. Thank you, Susan. Um, I find that right now the climate is so intense that you're either getting people who are saying, we got to make a change. We got to do something. And then there are others who are just showing their distaste for the, the call out for change. And they're showing it more because we have leadership that's stoking emotions and feelings of division. And I find that some of the places where in the congregations where people have been able to hide, they're losing that ability and other folks around them are surrounding them with love and surrounding them with, with come back from there, come away from that place. But it is definitely a tug of war right now in the congregations. So Wendy was going to ask you all, and you can always go back to the question that I asked or the question that Valerie asked, and if anyone can jump in, and we really want to hear from you. But Wendy was going to ask you, if, if not now, if we don't make these changes now, um, then when? And when? You know, what can you imagine in the next 10 years? Um, what do you think we should do next 
you know, as a church in regards to anti-racism. And again, these questions are inter intersectional. So you can go back and you can mix them in with your responses. I could jump in on that one. Um, my experience after many years, decades of ministry is that I've never seen white congregations as open to talking about uh, racism as now. And I, I agree with Wendy. I think, you know, the obviously the, the very hard uh, uh, racist response is also very real. Um, but most of my experience has been very much like uh, what I think it was Tom at the beginning was saying that uh, white congregations and white people in general tend to just stay as much away from, don't want to talk about, don't want to have anything to do with, want to ignore the whole conversation around race. And I feel like that's harder to do right now. And uh, we've we've done a few things. We've had a, a study on a book, Dear White Christians, which I think is fabulous for white congregations and pastors um, because it really urges us to move from a paradigm of reconciliation to one of reparations where we really begin to name harm and address harm that has been done is continuing to be done. Um, so I found some openness, you know, there's always that reluctance, but it, I've, it, my experience has been pushing a little bit in preaching and in Bible study and in, in uh, that people are open. I think people realize it's something we have to do whether we want to or not. So I think it's a great time to push at the annual conference level, at the local church level, uh, this is a conversation that we must have. If we don't have it now, 10 years from now, we might not be here. So, I mean, this is the critical qu uh, conversation that needs to happen at all levels of the church. And so I'm feeling real motivated to, to push at this moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, Karina, Karina, go ahead. So I, I serve four, four churches in, in the Hudson Valley. And interesting is I, there are four white churches and I'm the only um, Latina woman in, in this congregation. And I will say the only person of color um, placing myself within that uh, range. And sometimes I feel like there's a disconnect with what is happening in the world and what it's in the church, it's happening in the church. And even though there has been a little bit of progress, it's continued to be a, a little bit difficult for me to uh, be as open as I would like to be in calling things by their name. Um, I, we just started, we started a, I, I initiated an anti-racism uh, conversation, um, anti-racism initiative, that's how I called it. And, um, kind of to have a, a conversation once a month, at least about some of the topics. And I asked the lay leaders to lead it, so it wouldn't be just, you know, the, the Latina pastor talking about this in, in a very um, touchy things for them, that it's to talk about white privilege, white supremacy, uh, concepts that I cannot talk with them. I remember the first time I mentioned dear white Christian to somebody that was asking and she got offended that anybody will have written that book and a book like called like that. So for me, it's even though we have started that conversation and there has, there is a, a rep representative for one of the one representative from each church, um, there's still like a, a, di a disconnect because these are new things for them. This is our new thing. And I, talking about the third question, it's for me is urgent. For me, it's urgent. And, and not only, I don't think these are themes that um, are new. I mean, we've been talking about all this homelessness, BLM, displacement, food insecurity, immigration for decades, and they are not new. It's just how disconnect was the church from not only providing the mercy works, not only doing the mercy works, but moving to justice. Uh, 
this week I heard somebody say, well, I support the immigrants. They come to the food pantry. And for me, that was so painful to hear because how do we move from a bag of groceries into working for justice for immigrants, so for new immigrants, because we are, we're all immigrants. So for the new immigrants that are coming, that it's a different um, context that they're coming from. And um, someone that just experienced um, a medical trauma, for me, there's no time I have to leave my day. Today is the day. Today is the day to do something. Today is the day to love. Today is the day to care. Today is the day to have compassion. Today is the day that we need to change. I don't have time. I, somebody told me, well, maybe past five years, we're going to be in another position. I say, I don't even know if I have five years. I have to leave after this. I have to leave day by day. So today is the day that I, I cannot wait until the next sermon series to talk to you about Black Lives Matters and immigrants and homeless and food insecurity and poverty. And that is not tomorrow, it's today. Mm -hmm. And if God gives me more tomorrows, amen. But but today is the day. So I, for me, it's urgent. And um, I'm, I think I'm, um, I wanna be optimistic that at least some folks are getting and that they will carry on the conversation but it needs to be more than um, reading a book because people of color have been talking about this for a century. And, and there, it needs to be more than, it needs to be a work of the heart. And, 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 and us as pastors, we are called to do it. We are called to um, move our, move our, our, our parishioners, our con whatever, whoever is hearing the word, to move them from the mercy work into the justice work, because it, we cannot just stay in the mercy work. Thank you. So how has your congregation, your community you serve, responded to this culture climate? This is to this culture climate. Can I, can I speak? Uh, I can, Reverend Vivian P. Taylor, um, also I've former pastor of Taylor Perfection War Outreach Ministries and also co-CEO of Royal Opportunity Access Radio, where we will be blessing, hopefully, the next couple of weeks, Harmony Conference, we'll be talking about discussion on air, 9.30 a.m. Just real quickly, um, how the cops in the neighborhoods and relating into culture. Um, and I'll just bring you back to uh, last year, the horrible shooting um, in Jersey City when the, uh, the the man and woman shot and killed um, the police officers, um, it, which was horrible, um, which, which was really horrible. But when we're talking about culture and people, um, we never saw a response of the news focusing on um, uh, people of Hasidic Jews indicating that was their community and, and really being honest with you, they, some people had just moved in that community and not acknowledging all the community leaders and the churches were in the community. And that was just a little taste of far as in the attention that even police from other states came to focus on Jersey City that never happened prior to this time. So just that the culture, the environment and how white privilege, white society had put that situation as that was a black issue instead of two individuals who are crazy and killing people for no business. So just that's something just to bring up. Thank you. We have just two more questions and we're going to um, be tying everything up. And Tom had a question. I do. What ways, what ways are your church responding to or reacting to Black Lives Matter. Um, we um, we decided to place a Black Lives Matter sign on our lawn, and I have to be I have to be honest. Uh, I have gotten more hate mail and emails on that sign, mostly from my congregation, than I have in any issue that I've confronted in my forty five years in ministry. Um, I'm pained by that, to be honest. And um, I was, I was kind of taken back Tuesday at our men's group 
where um, I was personally attacked for allowing that sign. Yeah. Um, and I, I came away and I, I cried. I, I honestly uh, found it difficult to go on that day. Uh, but at the same token, on the other hand, I should say, I've received more emails and texts of support for the sign than I have any other issue that I've dealt with in my ministry. So it's split. Um, we have, we have um, made a decision that we're going to do more than have a sign on our lawn. Um, the local, uh, locally, the uh, uh, Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance has put together a, um, a project called Planting Racial Justice Activization Teams. And it requires a, a, a core group to commit to six months of training and a major commitment, financially commitment to the church of a minimum $6,000. And we voted to do that. And before I even put it out to the congregation, uh, it's closed at eight people for the core team. I had seven people um, in terms of the group that, that I presented it to our church council. Uh, I, I had seven people signed up plus myself. So um, we've decided that that's the route we're going to take. And we hold, uh, we've been ha studying white fragility. Um, and obviously not everyone is in that study, but I have to say that one or two of the individuals who sent me uh, an email protesting the, the sign is in that group. So uh, I, I give them credit for wanting to have an open mind and, and to discuss the issue. Uh, I can't say that we've made any progress, but uh, I'm thrilled that, that they're at the table. And as we work through this difficult book for uh, us white folk, um, they've stuck to it. And uh, that, that to me is a, an encouraging sign. So um, I do pray, I do ask prayers for the West Hartford United Methodist Church, uh, and for me personally, that I'll have the fortitude and the strength to go through this uh, and uh, not get too discouraged, but uh, it's been very painful. But also, I will say this, that um, I made a commitment a long time ago that racial justice was going to be the issue that I stand firm on. And... Um, um, and as I said, I won't go down on any program, but I'll go down on this issue. So that's where we're at. Thank you, Bob. We have one last question, and we don't want to hold you longer. And I just want to throw something in there really quickly. I've been doing a, uh, we've been reading a book called The Bridge, Be the Bridge, Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Reconciliation by Latasha Morrison. And one of my lay leaders yesterday who have been a little bit combative because this book deals with reparations, which is a very controversial issue. Uh, but he said, he said to the group yesterday, he understands now. And he didn't at first, but he does now. And he said, thank you. And he said, I'm sorry if I've been, you know, a little combative, but I get it. <laughs> Crystal, so, that is a <laughs> uh, sign of the Holy Spirit working because I know who you're talking about. <laughs> So I say that to say we have to keep going and we have to do it in love, but we can't give up. We have to carry the cross because people will change. People will change. Amen. Amen. I have a similar story with, with one of my parishioners. Um, when I started off in East Berlin, I was told he quit the church because a black pastor was coming and, and a black pastor that supports black lives matter. He's now doing, um, visits with the shut-ins with me um it's amazing if we just be like peter and keep our eyes on god we can walk on water mm -hmm. this is a god's work and um I, i'm i'm excited i'm excited and i believe um the next question is um how have you been doing how we talked about your congregations we even talked a bit about your communities. How have you been doing during this cultural time and during this pandemic? How is, how is your soul? 
I would love to hear from I will I would love to hear from anyone who jumps in, but I hope you don't mind me putting them on the spot. Derek's been working with the homeless population since the beginning of COVID. And I would love to hear him say something. <laughs> Reverend Derek Watson. And if he doesn't, someone else just jump in because I don't want to put him on the spot. <laughs> I'm privileged. Well, if he doesn't, I would love to hear from our DS. Well, my former DS, but my guy, Tim Riss. So good to see you. Well, Derek just came in, and maybe we'll hear from the DS right after Derek. Good to see you, Derek. We, I, I bow before the DS, so Timothy, you can come on. Well, <clears throat> this is the um, this is the self reflection uh, question, and uh, uh, I got to tell you, um, uh, my my health has gone down. Um, I have uh, been diagnosed with high blood pressure, and uh, the first course of treatment isn't effective so I'm getting a more powerful set of pills to take and I check in with the the uh, doctor uh, in a couple of weeks and uh, and I think uh, there's a connection between the twin pandemics and uh, and uh, the the stress that that we are all under and I'm trying to be a resource to pastors who are under a lot of stress and a bishop who's under a lot of stress and a cabinet is under a lot of stress. And guess what? Now I'm under a lot of stress. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the story about how I'm doing, but full of hope because there's, there's been such a, such a, a, a change that, uh, that white people, myself uh, included, are, are now um, facing things they didn't face before. I'm so sorry to hear that, uh, DS Tim. And I, I believe we believe God is a healer. And as much as our churches have lost, I'm praying, have lost its credibility, God is still God. And so let us pray. God, we come before you as leadership for such a time as this. For your word says, I saw a great multitude in which John writes, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne of God. We are that people. And we come before you because you are God and God alone. And so God, we praise you even in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of sickness, and we say to every mountain, and we stretch out our hands to the sea, and we know, God, as we have come and we've already begun to move, we ask, Lord, that you would remove everything in our body that brings upon the stress and the cares of this world as we are dealing with this systemic what seems like a pharaoh in a time as such as this, almost impossible, but all things are possible with you, God. And so in our weakness, you are made strong. We ask, Lord, that every breath that we breathe in, that we remember that you give breath. You give life. And as long as you breathe in us and we let us out, you will equip us to do what we need to do. For your word says that in a blink of an eye, we shall be changed. You are all knowing. You are all powerful. You are God and God alone. And we thank you for this time. We thank you for our leaders. We pray a special blessing on everyone that is here today and that they remember their work is not in vain for everything that we do for Christ will last. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tim, for your, your dedication and the support you've given to all of us um, throughout these years. And I thank you for your wife also. Amen. As she has been supportive to us also, especially my time in Newburgh. Um, I thank God for my wife um, putting this together and everybody putting this together, matter of fact. And I thank God for being invited to this dialogue. And I, I'm truly blessed by hearing everybody and the faith of everybody and the commitment of everybody. Um, it's been really challenging for me here working in the city and, and helping my staff and our clients stay healthy and not infected by, by the COVID-19. It was really 
chaotic in March and April. I mean, it was it was people were getting sick and dying um, just right in front of me, and it was very hard. And um, to the point where people were worried about me, um, if I was going to make it. But one of the things I always had in my mind that if God is with me and this is it, this is the will of God, then everything's going to be all right. And if I die during this process, I die during this process. But as you can see, that God, I live because he lives and so i continue to press on to help and help as much as people as possible and and connect people to resources so they can get their lives changed and, and changed around so um i'm feeling great feeling good i thank god for uh, saving a mess like me um but he's not finished with me yet and he's not finished with you guys yet either um the fact that we're still here um and we press into but one of the main things as we talk about in closing um, in this Harmony Conference and, and, and our Harmony initiatives is that um, what Martha Luther King said is that our lives begin to don't matter anymore when we become silent for the things that matter. And so we must not remain silent at all. Whatever we can do to bring uh, awareness to injustice and awareness to uh, division um, we must do what we need to do, or what does our life matter? So, um, as Jesus says always in Matthew 25, when I was a stranger, you took me in, and when I was naked, you clothed me, and when I was hungry, you fed me. Um, so we must continue to do what God has called us to do, and don't forget it. I don't care how big the obstacle, whether it's people, individuals, finances, or our bodies sometimes, um, God gave us a commission and gave us a work to do, and we do it until we finish. Amen. Amen. With that being said, thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us. Please continue to pray for the Harmony Conference. We're going to move forward in these discussions of harmony and of unity and of change. And eventually, we will have annual Harmony events that will be composed of singing, music, and good food and fellowship and smiles and us coming together. But until that time, we're going to continue to leave this communication open so that we are stronger together. I am for harmony. I am for harmony. I am for harmony. I am for harmony. Yes, I am for harmony. I am for harmony. I am for harmony. We are for harmony. We are for harmony. Harmony. Stronger. Together.